Okay, today we are going to look at resistance and conductance. Now, we mentioned last time we could have our ideal voltage source over here. We could hook it up to something. Right, we said a light. Maybe a little motor, maybe a block of cheese, and there would be a current that would be created. All right? So we have a voltage on this source, and a current comes out like so. This is called conventional current flow, this direction from positive to negative. In reality, the electrons are going the other way. Uh, very often we indicate that with a dashed line rather than a solid line. That's called electron flow. Really, it all goes back to uh, Benjamin Franklin, who sort of took a guess, and uh, he was wrong. Well, we use conventional flow. It doesn't really make any difference. Um, here's a little example. Here's a pen. And you could say, is it rolling that way? Right? Is it going from this point to this point? Or is it that the space over here now winds up over here and this trades places with it right so one we literally recall call uh, electron flow the other we call hole flow this will be more apparent as we go down through this se uh, sequence of videos but all you just have to remember is conventional current flow flows from positive to negative the question is what controls that current? How big is it? In other words, what's inside the box? Well, you've probably heard the term conductance before. You say something is very conductive. Well, conductance uses the letter G, and it has units of Siemens, S. Resistance, on the other hand, R has units of ohms. And we use the Greek letter omega to indicate ohms. Okay, if something is highly conductive, we would get a lot of current. So resistance and conductance are reciprocals. Right? The resistance to current flow versus the ability to conduct current. All right, so R is 1 over G, or G is 1 over R, however you want to look at that. Now, in days of old, conductance had units of Mohs, which is basically ohms spelled backwards, and they would use an upside-down omega on here. Kind of a goofy idea, because, you know, who thinks that retrograde is an inversion, okay? But... Fortunately, you know, we don't do that anymore. We just call it Siemens. But you might see that in some, you know, old technical documents and so forth, so you don't get confused. All right. Very often we just deal directly with resistance values, although sometimes uh, conductance is convenient, but we're going to start off just looking at resistance. So we're going to just look at a sort of a generic piece of material. There's just some block of stuff. Okay, now it has a length, L. We're going to pass current through it like this. All right, so this is the direction of our current flow. So there's a length, L. There is a cross-sectional area, A. And these things will play a role in determining what the resistance is. As will the material it's actually made out of. You know, what is this? Is it a chunk of carbon? Is it a chunk of copper? Is it a chunk of gold? Um, is it a chocolate brownie? Right? Well, that characteristic, that material characteristic, we call resistivity. And it has... A symbol, the Greek letter rho, kind of looks like a P, right? but in sort of 
anglicized, we would spell it out like that, rho, resistivity. Okay, we can look up uh, values of resistivity on charts that'll tell us you know, what that value is for a certain material. And the text, which he reaches over here and grabs, we have, you probably can't see this, but this is on page 49. And we have a listing of various materials and what the resistivity happens to be. So for your convenience, I'm just going to copy down a couple of them. So silver has a resistivity of 1.59 E minus 6. Now the units in here uh, are ohm centimeters. Ohm times centimeters. Copper. 1.68, so it's a little higher. And as you can guess, right, if it's resistivity, the bigger this number is, the more resistive it is, the less conductive it is. Gold, 2.44. Aluminum, aluminum, if you prefer. And then we can go into some uh, other materials. For example, um, silicon is uh, way, way larger. Um, we're looking at about 6.4 times 10 to the fourth. Get into air. What is the resistivity of air? Uh, this depends a lot on you know humidity and so forth, but. Basically, we give it a range, 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 17th, pretty wide range. Okay, not the highest thing you can get. For example, there are a, a series of uh, what are called dielectrics that we use for capacitors, um, like uh, Teflon, for example, that are way up there, like um, 10 to the 25th, 10 to the 27th. Huge values, huge values. Okay, so these values give you an indication of how easy it is for current to flow through here, the conductivity. It turns out resistance is equal to rho, the resistivity, times the length L divided by the area A. So here, obviously, we would be talking about uh, units in terms of centimeters, right? Square centimeters for an area, same thing for the length. Um, and what we would have, of course, is ohm centimeters times centimeters, which gives us ohm centimeters squared divided by an area in square centimeters. And we just end up with ohms for an answer. So what we find, just looking at this equation, is the greater the length, the more resistance. And that kind of makes sense, right? If you think of the current flowing through here, the farther it has to go through this material, well, the greater the, the resistance is going to be. And if you can spread it out over a greater area, cross-sectional area here, then the smaller it will be. And obviously, the greater the resistivity, the larger the resistance. So here's an interesting question. You notice that silver is sort of tops on this list than copper. Well, it's pretty obvious why we use copper wire in your house rather than silver. I mean, it'd be a pretty expensive house wiring job if you wired everything in silver. But notice the copper is better than gold. So why do we have connectors, you know, for um, various devices like, you know, here's a headphone connector. This is gold. Why is this gold? Why isn't this copper? If, in fact, gold has um, a higher resistivity, so I get higher resistance, isn't the whole point to have low resistance for a connector like that? Well, yes, however, the important difference between these two things and the reason why you use gold here, it's not just to impress people because you got gold-plated connector, it's because gold is a noble metal and it doesn't tarnish. 
copper does. Copper will get a patina on it, in other words, a copper oxide surface, and that is much higher in resistivity than the copper itself. So gold does not tarnish. Consequently, we, call, we uh, coat the uh, connectors that we have with gold. Right? That's a very sensible sort of thing that we're looking at. Okay, consider wires. All right. So here we are, this nice little chocolate brownie looking thing. Now take a wire. So there's a cross-sectional area on this wire, right? Well, the larger the diameter of the wire, the less resistance it has, or the greater the conductivity, however you want to look at that. So you could also think of that in terms of current carrying capacity. Right? This will be able to carry more current than this will. Matter of fact, the whole concept of a fuse is just a very fine wire that when the current gets up to a certain value, it basically melts that fine wire and you get an open circuit and there's no path for current flow anymore. Okay, we have something called AWG, American Wire Gauge, which will give you a clue into this. So getting back to your book. So here we are looking at page 51. Here's a nice chart that gives you the American wire gauge, gives you some uh, physical measurements in terms of diameter. But here's the really interesting bit. Since we know this is going to be made out of copper, right? virtually all wire, and there are some exceptions, but general purpose wire is going to be made out of copper. So we know what the resistivity is. right? We know this. And the gauge tells us what the area is so we can figure out resistance per unit length all right resistance per unit length and this is what we see now awg the, the smaller the number is the bigger the diameter so you know this would be a small number here like this would be like maybe like a number 10 this is not drawn to scale okay but i'm just saying if this was a number 10 then, you know, this thing over here might be like a, a number 14. And, you know, this thing over here might be a, you know, maybe a number 18 or something like that, right? Just to kind of get a better idea of that. So, you know, what we, what we would see here is that, uh, you know, let's see, a number 16 cable, which is like zip cable. It's the common thing that you would use for lamp cord. All right, so this is uh, a little over 13 ohms per kilometer, or if you prefer, um, about 4 ohms per uh, 1,000 feet. All right, so a number 16 wire is approximately 4 ohms per 1,000 feet. And if we went to a finer gauge hookup wire, like the wire that you would use on... Uh, uh, let's say a proto board, right, to wire up something which might be a number 22. Now this is stranded wire, but the 22 would be solid. Um, so in that case, we're looking at about 16 ohms, again, per thousand feet. All right, so 4,000 feet of number 16 is going to have as much resistance or as much conductance, however you want to look at that, as 1,000 feet of number 22 cable. So you could measure a coil of wire, right? And imagine you're in a lab and you've got this huge coil of wire and you want to know what the resistance is. Well, you don't uncoil the thing. You just get yourself an accurate ohm meter, right? A digital multimeter that has an ohm scale on it. And you... Put your clips on either end of the coil and you read the resistance. You can look up the value on an AWG uh, uh, table and then you can just figure out what the value is. All right. So, um, you know, if, if I measured my 22 gauge cable, right, and it had, um, just to use an easy number, right, if it was like, if it came out to 8 ohms, then at 16 ohms per thousand foot, you know that this thing has to be 500 feet. Very straightforward, right? Nice linear sort of progression there. Okay, schematic symbol for a resistor. So this is the ANSI symbol. This is the North American standard. 
The European standard, the Euro standard, looks like this. It's just sort of a little box. Almost looks like that, right? So depending on where your uh, schematic came from, you'll see one of the two. Then we have adjustable resistors. And what we do is uh, an adjustable resistor simply would be a rheostat. And that would just have a little arrow through it like that. There's also something called a potentiometer, which we will look at soon enough which is a three lead element. And the schematic symbol for that is like so. So the rheostat is just, you imagine a value going from zero up to some value, right? So the, the Euro version of this also has an arrow through it. All right. Now, are there other kinds of devices just in these simple resistors? You know, you go into lab and you hook resistors on a proto board to a power supply, you measure currents and voltages and so forth. Well, there are many different kinds of resistive devices sitting out there that we can use. And generally speaking, you know, the kind of resistors we use for circuit designs, normal quote unquote resistors, we like them to be perfectly stable with environmental conditions. In other words, temperature goes up, if the uh, humidity changes, you know, the light level changes, whatever the heck it is, the resistance is the value. You know, if it's a thousand ohm resistors, it's a thousand ohms, and that's the end of it, period. But we do make devices that are sensitive to environmental conditions. And because of that, because we can get the resistance to change, we can now use that to control a current or a voltage, as you'll see, and therefore use that as a measurement device. So there's many different kinds of these things. For example, we have something called an FSR. That's a force sensing resistor. And basically when you squeeze these things, right, they usually come in either a little square or round uh, things with a couple leads on them. So you push down on it and the resistance actually goes down, right? So if it's an open, if you're just leaving it out there, it might be hundreds of thousands of ohms. And then when you push down on it really hard, you know, you might get 100 ohms. So you can use that to measure force because that will interact with the voltage source and change the current. Exactly how? We'll see very soon in an upcoming video. Other things we have, light dependent resistor, also known as a photoresistor. So a photoresistor, very often they'll use a symbol like this. They'll just show like a little arrow going into it, which is sort of uh, indicating light. Well, it's light dependent. So the more light that hits it, the lower the resistance. So if it's a completely dark room, you know, this thing might be a couple hundred K ohms. Outside at noon, sunny day, you know, it might be 50 ohms. All depends on the design, but it is light sensitive. Then we have what's called a thermistor. So a thermistor is temperature sensitive, right? So that's also known as a temperature dependent resistor. And these come in two types, uh, NTC, negative temperature coefficient, and uh, PTC, which is a positive temperature coefficient. What does that mean? So an NTC looks like this. So if you have a resistance on this axis and a temperature on this axis, you get something that kind of goes like this. So you have a nominal value. So let's say this is room temperature you know, around 25 degrees centigrade. And then if you go up to some other temperature, you know, here you are at 100 degrees centigrade, now you get a different resistance value. So it's negative temperature coefficient because this slope is negative, right? It's decreasing as the temperature goes up. All right, there are other kinds of devices out there as well, but really these are just devices that, um, like I said, are sort of tuned so that they are sensitive to some particular environmental uh, input, right? Oh, strain gauge, there's another one. Forgot about that one. So a strain gauge is used literally to measure strain, like on a piece of metal. So um, essentially you can just imagine like a long wire and if you were to uh, bend it, it stretches out. And as it stretches out, the cross-sectional area decreases a little bit. 
and the end result is you get an increase in resistance. And if you do it the other way, it sort of compresses, right? So if it was on my hand and I kind of went like this, it would compress, squeeze down, length wouldn't be as much, area would get a little uh, fatter, and the resistance would go down. All right, so again, there's more devices that we could come up with, come up with but uh, this kind of gives you a sampling. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is kind of put this whole thing together into an appropriate circuit where we're going to drive our resistive values with either a voltage source or a current source and see what happens.